although she was born and raised in England, she really belongs to the whole world. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Petula Clark. She's a delight, Miss Petula Clark. Speaking of Petula Clark, here's a very lovely, a very talented girl who aims to please, and her aim is right on target. I suppose most American audiences think that my career started with downtown. Well, my career started way, way back when I was a very little girl in England. My mother was Welsh, and the Welsh are very musical. They're a bit like the Italians. They just sing at the drop of a hat. And my father was a frustrated actor. He was very handsome. He looked just like Errol Flynn and uh, he was never allowed to be an actor. So when he heard his daughter singing around the house, he thought, ah, she's got some talent, you know. So he sort of encouraged me, I think is the word. We had no influence, we had no money. And I started singing in school concerts and then I sang in chapel in Wales. And it was the war in England, Second World War. <laughs> and uh, I started singing for the troops who were stationed in Great Britain. And then I made my first radio appearance on BBC, and it just went on from there. By the time I was eight, I was a star, a child star. Looking at his mammy with eyes so shiny blue Makes you think that I started acting in movies, um, once again, during the war. They were rather austere sort of black and white movies because we didn't have a lot of money in England during that period. And I was signed to the J. Arthur Rank organization and I made about 25 movies as a child, as an actress, not as a singer. You all right, pet? I wish I could find a hole to put my hip in, Mum. It keeps sticking up. Well, here's my cushion. Try that. Thanks. If we tried to get a bit of sleep, perhaps we'd forget how hard the pavement is. All right, Dad. Are you all right now, pet? Yes, thanks, Mum. I worked with some good people during that time. Alec Guinness and 
Peter Ustinov. Anthony Newley was someone I knew and loved dearly. Oh, actually, I had a crush on him when I was a kid. The tricky thing about being a child performer, of course, is that you have to grow up. <laughs> you know, everybody grows up. And uh, I think it was a very emotional thing for the English public because wartime was a very special time for everybody living in Great Britain. We'd been through a lot and uh, we had been through a lot together. I sort of represented that time for them. They didn't want to see their little girl growing up and having a little bit of bosom and, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> singing about love and stuff. It was very difficult for me because I didn't want to sing little girl songs anymore and I wanted to wear grown-up clothes. Eventually, of course, I, I, I grew out of that adolescence bit and the English public realised that, you know, there was no holding me back. I was, I was growing up and I had my own television show and I had some hit records. I started getting these phone calls from France. Oh, you must come. We would love to hear you sing in Paris. I had no desire to go, but anyway, I went. And I was in this office at the record company and suddenly the light went out and this young man came in, stood on the desk and changed the light bulb. And then the boss said to me, oh, this is Claude Wolf. He's our PR man. If you come to Paris and record, he will be taking care of you. And I said, okay. <laughs> And a couple of weeks later, I was back with my first French record and I, we were married 18 months later and I became a huge star in France. I mean, it was a whole new life, a new career, everything. And it was a great, great thing, a total accident. And isn't that what life's about? At that time, I was working mostly in France. I was living in Paris. I already had two small children. Tony Hatch was a young English record producer um, at a record company with whom I had worked for a while. And then one day he came to Paris to uh, prepare a new record in French. And he came to the apartment and uh, he said, you know, you." You really should be recording in English again. I had just returned from, uh, from America. I had just had the first idea about um, downtown, but I hadn't got anywhere with it. All I had was the melody and the one word downtown, where it appeared, where it still appears in the song now, but I had no other lyrics at all. And um, I, I played it to her somewhat reluctantly because I just felt it was too early. I wasn't really ready to present the song to anybody. But. Um, she, bless her, said, uh, uh, that is a, that's going to be a great song. You know, if the lyric is as good as the, as the, as the tune and the, the whole idea of it, uh, that's what I want to record. I really do owe it to her because she saw something in the song that I hadn't even uh, recognised. I was working with Warner Brothers Records and I was head of A&R and this all began in October 1964 when I was on my first trip to Paris and visiting Vogue Records and they said uh, we have something we just recorded and they brought in Downtown and played Downtown for me which shook up everything for me then because it was an immediate hit sounding record and I flew right back to LA we got it into production immediately, and we had a home run record right out of the box. And uh, I remember getting a call from our distributor saying we had passed a million, and we gave everybody the rest of the day off, and we bought them all lunch, but it was our, our celebration. That was our first million-selling record. Actually, we're quite proud of this lady. Uh, you reviewed part of her track record, Lloyd. Uh, in the past 16 months, she's had six records, all in the top 10, three number one, four best-selling albums, named top female vocalist by every disc jockey poll, 
And the record industry has its own recognition in the form of these Grammy Awards. Mm -hmm. And in her first year out uh, for downtown, she won an award for the best record of the year. And this past April at the Grammy Awards here at the Beverly Hilton Hotel in Los Angeles, Tula Clark was awarded the honor of top female vocal performance for I Know a Place. And for I Know a Place, oh, yes. yes. British invasion, as it was called, was was an extraordinary thing because um, up until then, talent had been coming from America to the UK, and it was all one-way traffic, you know. And suddenly, the Beatles changed all that. They opened the gates, and in we went, you know. <laughs> and it was very exciting, of course. The 60s and 70s were an amazing time. I mean, I'm not particularly nostalgic, but I have to say that they were great, great times. Musically, uh, it was very inventive. People were coming up with wonderful sounds, you know, the mummers and the puppers and the Beach Boys and, of course, the Motown. And I found myself joyously part of that. This is the night. This is the greatest lineup of musical talent in the biggest bash in showbiz history. Roger Miller, Joan Baez, Petula Clark, Ray Charles and his band, The Birds, The Lovin' Spoonful, Donovan, Ike and Tina Turner. When you're alone and life is making... I remember um, first meeting her, I think, around the time we did the Hollywood Palace show. There was something about her voice. Still is the most incredibly optimistic voice, while being uh, very soulful, very moving. I, I, I absolutely adore the way she sings. Buildings reach up to the sky. The traffic thunders on the busy street. Pavement slips beneath my feet. I walk alone and wonder who am I? Close 
I was working at um, the Coconut Grove, which doesn't exist any, anymore, unfortunately, in uh, Los Angeles. And Jack Warner of Warner Brothers was there. He asked me if I would do Finian's Rainbow with Fred Astaire, and that was great. So I said, yes, of course I will. <laughs> uh, so um, I met up with uh, Francis Coppola, who directed it. He was new in town very bearded, lots of hair, and he arrived in his funny old van from uh, San Francisco, very much the new blood in Hollywood. And of course, uh, Fred Astaire was, was the old style Hollywood. It was very funny to see that first meeting between the two of them, <laughs> and I was somewhere in the middle. We had such fun together. Look, look, look to the rainbow. That's Finian's rainbow. It's a pot of gold. And you stole it. I never stole it. I borrowed it. But whom did you borrow it from? Why do you want to know? So we can lend it right back to him, that's why. After Finian's rainbow, I went almost right away back to London to do um, Goodbye, Mr. Chips with Peter O'Toole. I, I played Mrs. Chips. And that was a totally different atmosphere. Her Ross was directing it. I thought the story was gorgeous. It was nice being back in England, making a movie in England after so many years away from the studios. 
And we also went to Italy, of course. We went to Pompeii, which was extraordinary. And Peter was, um, <laughs> Peter, Peter's an amazing guy. Peter O'Toole and Petula Clark star in a love story as timeless as forever. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Chips. In 1968, I did a special uh, with, um, my special guest in that show was Harry Belafonte. And we got on like a house on fire, you know, we, we had fun during rehearsals, it was great. When we came to do the taping, something very strange happened. The song that Harry and I decided to do together as our duet was a song which I co-wrote called On the Path of Glory. Kind of anti-war song, and we both felt quite strongly about it, you know. And uh, in the emotion of things, you know, uh, I, I touched his arm and it was just a natural thing to do. A very gentle human moment, uh, uh, certainly a very friendly thing to do. And uh, all of a sudden, at the end of the take, we were asked to wait. There had been some problem had arisen. The sponsor didn't want to see me, a white lady, touching a black gentleman's arm. That's what I call a storm in a teacup. I didn't understand. I thought the whole thing was ludicrous and rather disgraceful. You have to understand that the climate in America racially was quite, uh, uh, it, was a, it was in great upheaval. 
the civil rights movement had just crested. So Petula Clark made a huge commitment here by saying, we move forward. And I think that uh, her example uh, was, was able to encourage others to take a stand. We erased all the other outtakes knowing that the network or the sponsor might insist that we use one of the other takes in the show. And this gave them no option. The only tape we had was the, the song where they both stood side by side and touched, which was creatively the best tape. That's the story. But it went out the way we wanted it to go out. Why should men be forced men to kill? Be forced to kill? Why should they Hello, I'm Petula Clark. Hi, I'm... I'm Dean Martin. <laughs> hey, you be sure to watch Petula Clark on her special December 9th with her guests, David Frost, Peggy Lee, and the Everly Brothers. And you'll be there, won't you, Dean? You blow in my ear and I'll follow you anywhere. <laughs> I'll be there, I'll be there. <laughs> Hey, Dick, I've been trying to dial a Pet Clark direct, and I can't seem to get through. Well, call Long Distance. Long Distance! <laughs> I'm just returning Miss Clark's call. Tell her I don't know the way to San Jose either. Now don't forget me, because if you let me, I will always stand by you. You got trust me, that's how it must be. Hello, this is Sugar Ray Robinson. Will you tell Petula Clark I've got to get through to her, or they'll accuse me of throwing the call? Operator, how do I get to Clark? Just dial her. Oh, okay. <laughs> P E T. Look, operator, I can't get through. Just give Miss Clark my home phone number, will you? Saigon 4, 3000. Hello, operator. I was trying to call Pet Clark, but I got, I got this strange man on the phone. It, yes, he, he kept breathing heavily, and he said the most obscene things to me. Operator, you're a woman. You've just got to help me. What should I wear when I meet him next Thursday? <laughs> Clark and I are very good friends. Well, we're not exactly good friends. We just happen to know a lot about each other. Operator, please put me through. This is, this is an obscene call. This is the main office of the phone company. We'd just like to know if you're happy with our service. Hmm. I'm
Well, the great fun about doing um, the television specials back in the 60s and 70s was the, you know, the production numbers, the, the, the dancers, the costumes, all that stuff which we don't seem to see anymore. And uh, they took a lot of rehearsal, of course, but they were fun. And I, no, I'm not a dancer, but uh, they had great choreographers who could make you look good, you know, and uh, it was fun. It's a sign of the times that your love for me is getting so much stronger. It's a sign of the times, and I know that I won't have to wait much longer. You've changed a lot somehow from the one I used to know. For when you hold me now, you feel like you never want to let me go. It's a sign of the times. I've always enjoyed writing. Um, I play the piano uh, like Irving Berlin. I play in G flat or F sharp, the black notes. And Irving Berlin had this wonderful piano that he could play in that key and just shift it up, you know. Um, I wish I could get my hands on that piano. Uh, but I, I love to write. I love the act of writing. Um, sometimes I write music and sometimes I write lyrics, sometimes I write both. And when I don't write both, I, I love working with a co-writer. I just enjoy that very much. You're my destiny Our love was meant to be Searching was through the lonely years were over, over just a smile ago. Our spirit said hello. You seem to know who I am. We're part of a plan that's far too big. To understand, hold my hand, hold on, hold on, baby, 
to my way of thinking, she's certainly underrated as a songwriter simply because she's so unusual as a singer. There are voices you hear. You can hear Maria Callas, you never forget what she sounds like. Marilyn Horn is the same, Judy Garland's the same, Lena Horn is the same. Certainly, Petula Clark is the same. She falls into the category of having a very special voice. Once you hear it, you can hear it in the middle of the night or whatever, and you know it's Petula Clark and no one else. And I've been very fortunate in that she's uh, recorded some songs of mine, like The Wind of Change. Suddenly, there are now so many giants everywhere. So many men who think even God looks small when they are walking tall. And the wind of change is troubled. Could it be that his smile is just another kind of frown? Because he knows the world is finally falling down and going back to dust. And if we trust the men who trample on the grass, emptiness is all we can hope to ask for. But it's too late to change. Well, when I was growing up, um, most of my friends seemed to be listening to Judy Garland. And, you know, I love Judy Garland, like everybody, but in fact, I was secretly listening <laughs> to Peggy Lee. Peggy Lee and Lena Horne. They were my idols and particularly Peggy Lee, I think. There's something sort of mystical about her. She doesn't reveal everything. And I had the wonderful opportunity to sing with her. She was a guest on one of my specials, and that was oh, extraordinary for me. The night is cold, the street is bare, there's only the moon and me. My soul, dear fair, oh, where can my journey be? Land over the bridge and down the street, a familiar sound, a familiar feet, and once again, the world. She was great to work with. She's, um, she was an international star, still is, but she was, um, she had had big hit records over here by the time she came on my show. And we blended together very well. And I loved singing with her. She was just great. She's gorgeous. And I'm crazy about her. She can belt out things like Downtown and all those kind of songs, which she became very popular doing those. But I, I really love her when she sings that very nice, sweet, clear, bell-like tone. She's a great singer.
I did Las Vegas and things like that. That was a great time because that was the end of the Las Vegas of, uh, you know, the big stars. Um, when you could go in and do three weeks and if they didn't come to see me, they could see Sinatra across the street or down the street they could see Streisand or Presley. The town was really buzzing at that time. In the late 70s, I decided to give my American career a bit of a rest. We were fortunate to have three gorgeous children. There's Barra, who was our firstborn. She was born in London. Kate was born in Paris and Patrick was born in Geneva. We all went back to Switzerland and I really stopped singing altogether. I saw a lot of my family and um, enjoyed it. I think it was the kids who turned around to me one day and said, why don't you go back to work, mummy? <laughs> and so I did. In the early 80s, I was asked to do The Sound of Music on the London stage and I thought that was the f silliest idea, you know because for, for me, uh, Sound of Music was Julie Andrews. I, Julie's a friend, you know, and I thought, what are they asking me to do this for? And they said, we want a different Sound of Music. I think we did it in a more down-to-earth way. It wasn't quite so sugary. And uh, Maria von Trapp, the real Maria, came to see us in it. She said, that's the closest I've seen to, to what really happened. So it, it was very successful. And, and very enjoyable. Tell me it's not true. Say it's just a story. Blood Brothers is a musical written by Willie Russell, who also wrote Shirley Valentine and Educating Rita. And uh, I was asked to do it on Broadway. It had been a hit on, in London for many years, and um, I thought it was a very interesting thing to do uh, because it, the role is uh, a, a lady from Liverpool, very poor, uneducated woman. Uh, I found it quite a challenge. I would be listening to her sing this wonderful little melody to me every night, and she'd take me to her, <coughs> her breast and uh, put me here and sing this beautiful wilting melody and she'd sing it different a little bit every night and she'd do a little riffing and as I started listening to her sing night after night I realized that she was the classic definition of a white soul singer and you don't think about that you don't think of her as that but she can sing anything and really well I had seen Sunset Boulevard on Broadway with Glenn Close and uh, I had been impressed by it but I was not particularly moved by it. A couple of months later I got a phone call from Trevor Nunn who, who directed it. I had asked him what he thought I could bring to Norma Desmond and he said you will bring humour and vulnerability which one doesn't normally associate with Norma Desmond. So I did it on the London stage for over a year and then we did it again in, in the States. We took it out on tour. I have been truly blessed by the songs that I've been given to sing. Of course I, I choose some of them but um, you know some, some things just land there and certainly from downtown on, onwards when Tony Hatch was writing all that wond wonderful stuff for me I still adore singing all those great 60s songs. I'm not stuck in some time warp back there. I'm certainly very happy to go on singing Downtown, Don't Sleep in the Subway, Couldn't Live Without Your Love. They're still great songs. Pet Clark with the Downtown. One of those records that people seem to, that had such an impact that people seem to remember where they were the first time they heard it. A catchy song, catchy arrangement, and uh, certainly, uh, a unique voice and an immediately likable voice. Her pitch and her particular way of phrasing 
things, the little inflections here and there, and a timeless voice. I always thought that I was uh, going to be superwoman, you know, that I would be able to have a career and a family and uh, be a good wife and mother and, and, and a good artist. And you can't have two full-time jobs. It's just not possible. I think I've compromised on both sides. I've talked to my children since. I mean, they're grown up now. I'm a, I'm a grandmother now, too. They seem to think that I did a fairly good job. <laughs> I'm now working on my own one-woman show, which is, um, I suppose it's basically a concert, except that it has a little more of a concept to it. It will be autobiographical. I will be going back to my childhood. You see, I've never wanted to write a book, a biography. It doesn't appeal to me at all, so the show will be my version of that. I will talk about my life and make a few comments about what I feel about life and sing. So it's, uh, it, it's more or less telling a story in music. I'm not afraid to stand before you tonight stood here all through my life just like tonight oh but not quite we only ever show the parts we want to show the rest we hide away in some sacred place we build our own disguise that's sweeter in our eyes It makes the world much easier to face This is true But I can say this to you Though it's not easy to do Tonight, I know at last I'm not afraid What you think I am, oh, but now I can see that I must trust honesty and not deny all the truths that lie inside of me. I know I can depend on you, my precious friend. I know that you So tonight, I make a vow, I'm promising you now, I'm gonna give this everything I
people think that because I've been in this business for so long that it's easy for me. It's actually more and more difficult because I think more is expected of me and I demand more of myself. It's love, of course. It's the feeling of going on stage and communicating with an audience that I love best of all. The joy is so incredible. It's, it's, it's worth it all. So love.